Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, in this session, I'm very much pleased to introduce to you a younger colleague of mine from Gaziantep University, Associated Professor Dr. Zekia Akagelolo. Of course, as, as, um, I have to um, introduce her, and uh, as usual, uh, Dr. Zekia Akagelolo received her PhD from Ankara University, Department of English Language and Literature, in 2004. Her dissertation, The Study of Stoppardian Drama from the Standpoint of Postmodernist and Counter Postmodernist Attitudes, was published as a book by Ferla in 2008. Her other book, Roman Kuramuna Girish, was published last year by Ireland the Publishing House. From 2005 to 2009, she worked at Istanbul Kültür University as an assistant professor. Since 2009, she has been a faculty member at Gaziantep University, Department of English Language and Literature. Her area of interest are philosophy, postmodernism, new historicism, contemporary fiction, and drama. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Besides her academic studies, so you are uh, um, academic for many aspects, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Her academic studies, she writes comparative essays on visual arts, theory and literature at periodical art magazines in Turkey. Today, she is going to present us a paper titled New Speak and the Last Man. Yes, Zekiye Akakelolo. Thank you very much, Aydana Thanks for coming because I wasn't expecting anyone. <laughs> First of all, I should admit that uh, I'm amazed by the academic detachment of uh, my colleagues who presented in the morning because we are talking about 1984 and we live in Turkey. So, to pay homage to Orville, I did my best uh, to, I mean, uh, to, to sound less academic and more provocative today. <laughs> and I used the language of prose, for if there is hope, it lies in the prose. <laughs> I don't know if it is something good or bad, but here we are on the 4th of April to commemorate a fictional ancestor, Winston Smith. Today I feel myself as a 21st century reincarnate of an Oceania citizen addressing the Winstons and Julias of Turkey. I am very grateful to Evrim and all the professors and colleagues at Atılım for inviting me, for contributing to my thought crime and being willing to participate in my 20 minutes hate. <laughs> and I sincerely hope that there are no O'Briens among you. It has been almost 70 years since Orwell wrote the book and we believe to live uh, in a better, more developed age now. Ours is a high-tech century in which technology, machinery, science, means of transportation and communication reach their peak. All that is expected from us is to work happily, eat happily, travel happily, and come together, have fun, and enjoy ourselves. Somehow, however, this is not the case. Otherwise, Today we will be talking about Jane Austen, not George Orwell. <laughs> a month ago, a mainstream newspaper, Radical, was published with the banner headline TJ Window 64. And I'm sure you all know what it means. If you all understand the implied meaning of this banner headline, I'm sure you will agree with me when I take in this paper Newspeak as our common language with Oceania, Capitalism as our common economic system and the Nietzschean concept of the last man as our common ontology. To clarify this hypothesis, we should start our discussion with capitalism, which has become the established economic system since the Enlightenment. By the term Enlightenment, I mean the project whose goal was the disenchantment of the world, the dissolution of myths, and the substitution of knowledge for fancy. Enlightenment thought is strongly associated with the idea of progress which, from a humanistic perspective, implies that the world can become increasingly better in terms of science, technology, modernization, liberty, democracy, quality of life, 
increase in the ability of problem solving, etc. Orwell's satire was just about the truth value of this thought. In 1984, we see that the party which rules the dystopian Oceania has no illusions about the nature of its mission. Unlike many dystopian regimes, it makes no claims to attempt to save humanity or to improve the quality of life. Instead, it seeks only to perpetuate its own power. The politicization of science and technology in Oceania has, in fact, had a suffocating effect on science itself. It is mainly used for the electronic surveillance of the citizens and the development of weaponry. It existed on the sphere of exchange value and was reduced to an instrument. As a result, the technologically developed world of Winston is not enlightened at all. It is still a dark world full of myths. In Oceania, the party leader Big Brother is a myth. His opponent, Emmanuel Goldstein, is a myth. Law is a myth. These myths are imposed as real and there is no way for any citizen to prove the contrary. Myths are not replaced by rational thought and reality is reduced to manipulation or pseudo-events. In such a system, it is impossible to truly know anything. The novel can be analyzed as the illustration of how, in capitalist society, enlightenment became a myth in itself. Adorno and Horkheimer, in Dialectic of Enlightenment, had a similar thesis. For them, the scientific impetus of enlightenment is informed by a quest not for a liberating truth, but for a power that ultimately enslaves. Science was reduced to mechanical application, which didn't seek knowledge but information, not understanding but practical application. With the abandonment of thought, which in its reified form of mathematics, machine and organization, avenged itself on the man who have forgotten it, enlightenment has relinquished its own realization. This situation is oxymoronic. Winston's world was dark because it was an enlightenment project. It was a world where techno technology and mechanical devices were used to control the minds of the citizens. For the sake of progress, man was reduced to his caricature, the pseudo-individual who lacked style, themos, that is pride and dignity, consciousness and essence. The Enlightenment thought, when it first bloomed in the 17th century, used to believe that there was a stable entity called self. This self was able to arrive at knowledge. Only through the self-will Superstitions, uh, self could, uh, superstitions could be emancipated. This self was capable of reflecting upon his own judgments from a universal standpoint. These claims of the Enlightenment are no longer tenable. The institutions built upon them are exhausted and reason has no privileged position. In Oceania, man could only exist as a comrade, as part of the herd. Nietzsche was one of the few who recognized the dialectic of enlightenment, which had always been a tool for the great manipulators of government. The way in which the masses are fooled in this respect, for instance, in all democracies, is very useful. The reduction and malleability of man as worked for, uh, uh, are worked for as progress. So Nietzsche's last man was, in essence, the victorious slave in the so-called democratic system, the herd without shepherd. In the hidden agenda of the capitalist enlightenment project, there is no place for the individual because the system, normal as it is, offers no place to the subject to think, criticize, and evaluate. <laughs> Everything is mass produced, even the individual. Adorno and Horkheimer saw the real face of enlightenment modified by capitalism in 1944 and Orwell in 1948. The incognito of enlightenment has always been capitalism. In 1940s, it had a cruel, inhuman face, whereas now, under the cover of liberal democracy, it has a sympathetic human face. Ours is a form of modern, postmodern totalitarianism. The globalized late capitalism pushed everything to its limits and transformed culture to industry and ab abolished the dialectic between base and superstructure. Consequently, all culture is standardized, organized, and administered for the sole purpose of serving as an instrument of social control. In Winston's case, the capitalist system was a totalitarian one. In our case, it is global, which I believe it is just a euphemistic renaming of totalitarianism. Totalitarianism is a form of government that subordinates all aspects of its citizens' life to the authority of the state 
with a single charismatic leader as the ultimate authority. This is what we live in Turkey, with a slight difference. <coughs> Our charismatic leader is a technologically better equipped equivalent of the Big Brother since he uses holograms. <laughs> um, besides posters that can appear anywhere he chooses, three-dimensionally. <laughs> Globalization, on the other hand, is a popularized term which functions on the sphere of culture and economy. The progress of capitalism necessitates a consumerist ideology and is best applied in liberal democracies. Our difference from business in our so-called noble struggle for freedom and justice is uh, that whereas Winston wanted to secure his, ident his uh, dignity, we want to secure our pockets. <laughs> Liberal democracy is a double plus good newspeak term, which is invented to conceal the fascist, oligarchical or autocratic programs of government, just as English socialism, that is Ingsoc, was in Oceania. In neither totalitarian nor global system, it is possible to keep one's individuality intact. Winston was sadly optimistic in his endeavors, and he failed. We know the taste of our ancestors' failures and try to be content with what we get, just like monkeys who get their banana. In both Winston's and our case, privacy and subjectivity are inconsiderable. Newspeak is the official language of Oceania, and it is devised to meet the ideological needs of IMSO. In Turkey, we can call it Türkten, Turkish democracy. Its purpose is not only to provide a medium of expression for the worldview and mental habits pro proper to the devotees of Imsok, but make all the modes of thought impossible. It is invented to prohibit heretical thoughts. Its vocabulary is constructed to get smaller every year, and undesirable words are supposed to be eliminated systematically. Newspeak is not a means of communication. It is a device of thought control, as most of my friends already mentioned. It was not only designed to, designed to control ideology, but also to construct socio-political reality. The socio-political reality is just a simulated one. In Newspeak, there is no room for heterodoxy. It is composed of a chain of ideological signifiers without fixed signifiers. Signs do not have conceptual basis. As a pseudo-language, which doesn't have use value, it operates in a dystopic world as a fetish object. Newspeak demands collective conformity rather than individual expression. The I pronoun used by a new speaker is selfless. In this language, equations collapse, binaries are reversed, and rational thought is deemed redundant. Newspeak makes you accept 2 plus 2 is 5. Since the new speaker constantly double thinks, he remains in a condition of paranoia and inertia. It conveys discourses of propaganda. Party slogans like ignorance is strength, where freedom is slavery, war is peace are written in newspeak. In it, reality is a construct with no reference. The person who learns and internalizes it is a double plus good double thinker and a slogan repeating parrot. The citizens of Washington are acquainted with newspeak through media devices such as Times newspaper, telescreens, or other ideological state apparatuses. In our case, Newspeak is the brainwashing tool of mass media and is used in favor of the capital. We can give popular slogans of consumer society uh, as examples. Uh, like, I mean, I'm, to give examples from our po uh, popular slogans, we can uh, say, buy days mean pay days. Pay days mean better days. Buy now, the job you say may be your own. Buy your way to prosperity. Buy now and say, just do it. Impossible is nothing. Catch the way. <laughs> yes. As Baudrillard really states, the circulation, purchase, sale, appropriation of differentiated goods and signs today constitute our language, our code, the code by which the entire society communicates and converses. Such is the structure of consumption, its language by comparison <coughs> with which individual needs and pleasures are merely speech effects. The system, as Baudrillard shows, objectifies everything and reduces us to commodities. The greatest trick of the system is to create the illusion that every object claims to be functional just as every regime claims to be democratic. He shows how the system puts us into use and reduces us to mass-produced pseudo-functional stereotypes. The language of stereotype is newspeak. It domesticates and controls us. It conveys more and more information less and less meaning. Information devours its own content. It devours communication. 
Rather than creating communication, it exhausts itself in the act of staging communication. Behind the mise-en-scene of communication, the mass media, the pressure of information pursues an irresistible destruction of the social and the individual. Language functions as a means of propaganda and advertisement. Medium becomes its own message, simulacra of simulations, founded on information, the model, the cybernetic game, total operationality, hyperreality, which aims total control. Winston was supposed to keep silent and work. We are supposed to keep silent and consume. As Zizek humorously puts it, our system commands us not to think, not to politicize, not to remember the true causes of things, but just act, contribute money, so that we will not have to think. What Orwell names as double thing is renamed in our time as hyperreality, the generation by models of the real without origin or reality, which makes the lie the most effective form of truth. Our difference from Winston, again, is that we experience the same conditions but do not take them seriously. Winston's life was a mode of literal incarceration. He suffered shortages of goods. <coughs> Ours is a figurative one. We suffer abundance of goods. Winston suffered a lack of laughter or ironic detachment, but as Zizek states, we know that laughter and irony are part of the game. <coughs> the ruling ideology is not meant to be taken seriously because there is no norm for anything whatsoever. As cynical subjects, we know the distance between the ideological mask and the social reality, but nonetheless, we insist upon the mask. You may add other similarities, of course, such as constant surveillance, manipulations of media, etc., etc. We show symptoms of schizophrenia. We lack proper perception of time as past, present, and future. We both fall prey to conspiracy theories, share the feeling that the state has a has hidden agenda. Whenever we find ourselves in serious conversation about the state of humanity, we get bored. For relief, we go shopping, buy the newest model of smartphone, feel happy and say, yeah, whatever. Winston was a sad monkey without banana. We are the happy ones. We are the last man, the upgraded models, the descendants of Winston who sold his soul in order not to be uh, eaten up by rats. Winston, who on the 4th of April started to keep diary and curse the big brother is extinct now. We are the grandchildren of Winston who visited room 101. We are the last man, and our motto is, do it to Julia. <laughs> the last man is a TV watching, internet surfing, and constantly shopping monkey. He is one of us. We are conditioned by the system. While seemingly providing a state of welfare and material abundance, the system uses democracy or egalitarian discourses as its mask. For we know that today democracy is nothing but an empty performance. Yusef calls this the human face of capitalism. It operates very much like O'Brien, who tried to befriend Winston. The system seems to be morally approved, the morally approved guarantor of the welfare state and operates as if it is struggling for anti-capitalist social causes, such as justice and, and freedom, but when it comes to effectively and equally sharing the wealth, it is mute and dumb. It is how capitalism has beaten the socialist left, by way of making the capital serve the social uh, democratic welfare state. Our newspeak is just a euphemistic version of Oshinian's newspeak, a little updated and modified to meet the late multinational capitalist needs of the globalized world in the 21st century. For example, here are the many examples uh, for, for you. Instead of totalizing, we say globalizing. Instead of saying good, we hit like button in Facebook. Instead of saying plus good, we hit favorite button in Twitter. Insult in our newspeak is liberal democracy. Citizen is consumer. Enemy is terrorist. Dictator is party leader. War is defense. Class struggle is credit card debts. Friend is follower. BB for big brother is BB for Bashbakan. Emmanuel Goldstein is parallel state <laughs> in Turkey and Al-Qaeda in America. <coughs> Ministry of Love is Silivri in Turkey and Guantanamo in America. Unperson is Uğur Humcu. 
or from think, you name. U.S. invasion is our offspring. <coughs> Dissident is çapıdır. <laughs> Speak is chat, tweet or text message depending on the tool we use. The concept of happiness is reduced to shopping. Mediocrity is promoted to popular culture. In academic nomenclature, we find uh, even more uh, absurd examples of <laughs> new speak, such as phallogocentricism, <laughs> postcolonialism, ecocriticism, multiculturalism, anti antisemitism, <laughs> post postmodernism. Compared to these terms, double plus good would sound less idiotic. The word freedom still exists in our newspeak in a narrow sense, meaning freedom to spend, consume, watch TV, eat and sleep. The Prime Minister's balcony speech after the scandalous elections last week, exclaiming, democracy has won today, is newspeak. We can also give the example of the government spokesman announcing that there is no truth in the charge of widespread corruption within the cabinet. Nobody believes him. He knows that nobody believes him. We know that he knows it. He knows this too. No, it doesn't change anything as long as our medium of communication is news speak. Noam Chomsky calls the popular terms like peace process as a, an appropriate form of news, news speak. He says, in its technical sense, as used in the mass media and scholarship generally in the United States, it refers to peace proposals advanced by U.S. government. It shows that the U.S. is committed to peace then they start to think that the Palestinians should join the peace process, which means that they should accept U.S. dictates. If they don't, they become extremists or terrorists. Indeed, today we have never seen an American or Israeli terrorist. Terrorists are always the Arabs. They commit peace crime. We can multiply these examples. We know that we are mesmerized continuously by manipulative input, we do not, uh, yet we do not protest anything. This is the ontology of the last man. Nietzsche, the philosopher of the dangerous maybe, prophesied and lamented our coming in the 19th century. Uh, when we read the prologue of Zarathustra, we find our description. For Nietzsche, the last men are the most contemptible type of human being. They believe that they know things properly and do not need others' advice, although they are in a constant state of ignorance. Zarathustra asks, must one first better their ears that they may learn to hear with their eyes? Must one clatter like kettle drums and penitential preachers? Or do they only believe the stammerer? They are very proud of being uh, part of their culture. By being very civilized and cultivated, uh, they distinguish themselves from herds. Being so contented with what they are, they can never evolve into a higher state of man. Zarathustra says, quote, Alas, there comes a time when man will no longer launch the arrow of his longing beyond man, and the string of his bow will have unlearned to this. Alas, there comes a time when man will no longer give birth to any star. Alas, there comes a time of the most despisable man who can no longer despise himself. Unquote. Nietzsche also foresaw the coming of globalization. The last man is the conqueror of the world, and for him, nothing is out of reach. He settles in the world and spreads all over it like an insect or virus consuming it hedonistically. He is happy, healthy, lazy, pragmatic, and selfish. I quote, What is love? What is creation? What is longing? What is a star? So asks the last man and blinks. The earth has then become small, and on it there hops the last man, who makes everything small. His species is ineradicable like that of the ground flea. The last man lives longest. He, we have discovered happiness, say the last man, and blinked our heart. They have left the regions where it is hard to live, for they need warmth. One still loves one's neighbor and rubs against him, for one needs warmth. One still works for work is a pastime, but one is careful lest the pastime should hurt one. The last man... <coughs> The last man is democratic and egalitarian. <clears throat> this man lacks fine craftsmanship and is a perpetual child. He is not an artist, not a philosopher, not a poet or a thinker. <coughs> Sorry. He is not a fighter or revolutionary. He simply has nothing to say. I quote, One no longer becomes poor or rich, both are too burdensome. 
who still wants to rule, who still wants to obey, both are too burdensome. No shepherd and one herd. Everyone wants the same. Everyone is equal. He who has other sentiments goes voluntarily into the madhouse. Formerly all the world was insane, say the subtlest of them, and blink thereby. They have their little pleasures for the day and their little pleasures for the night, but they have a regard for health. We have discovered happiness, say the last man, and blink thereby." Unquote. As Fukuyama states, the last man at the end of history knows better than to risk his life for a cause, because he recognizes that history was full of pointless battles in which men fought over, over whether they should be uh, Christian or Muslim, Protestant or Catholic, German or French. The loyalties that drove men to desperate acts of courage and sacrifice were proven by subsequent history to be silly prejudices. Men with modern educations are content to sit at home, congratulating themselves on their broad-mindedness and lack of fanaticism. As Nietzsche's Zarathustra says of them, for thus you speak, real are we entirely and without belief or superstition. Thus you stick, our, stick your chest, stick out your chest, but alas, they are hollow." Unquote. For Fukuyama, the last man was the end of dialectical process. Liberal democracy brought the end of history. That's why he is the last man. Contrary to Nietzsche, Fukuyama celebrates the situation. Nietzsche, however, wanted to believe that there would be a time for the overman, the kind of man who was capable of overcoming mediocrity, who had the drive to become better. What do you think? Can we promise today that our next meeting will be on the 5th of November, or will it be another, 4th of April? Shall we be able to beat the mediocrity, kill the last man inside us, and say, down with the system? one day? Or shall we just scratch our bellies and say, yeah, whatever? Thank you. Thank you very much. Really, it was very interesting and also really provocative, really, as you have said. And it was also very academic, too. <laughs> oh, yes, the floor is open for questions, remarks. Incurable romantic yeah. Nietzsche. <laughs> well, um, okay. Um, 1984 uh, reads as a political allegory. Yeah. Okay, that's for sure. But how about this uh, romance? I mean, um, in 1984 yeah, or in Nietzsche? In, in 1984. Do you find any romance in it? Well, um, I mean, do, 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 you, do you mean Julia? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, Was it? Well, it, it wasn't well, long, there, long last. Well, there was poetry. There was I don't know uh, sex. Poetry, uh, yes. Yeah. Here comes the chopper to chop off your head. <laughs> if it is poetry, what? or under the chestnut tree, I saw the and you yeah. saw me. Yeah. But I don't call them romance. Okay, what do you call it? I don't know. A kind of uh, temporary. Uh, I mean, I mean, yes. I mean, they, uh, they intended to love each other. They just maybe started to love each other, but it didn't last long, and it was impossible because they lost their spirits. In, in, the, in the novel, there, there is a uh, very interesting dialogue between O'Brien and Winston. Uh, contrary to what Nietzsche means by the last man, is uh, meant by O'Brien. For, for O'Brien, uh, uh, Winston was the last man, because he was a man of spirit, but he meant the real human being, because he had spirit. But Nietzsche's last man is a man without. And in the novel we, we see that uh, spirit is, it, it couldn't live long, so if there's no spirit to talk about, it, it, I mean, how can we talk about romance? Really? Maybe I'm too <coughs> cruel about it, but <laughs> I don't know what to say. Yes. Any, anyone else? Any remarks? Any questions? Okay, since there are no questions, okay, so this is the end of this session. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm
edition of George Orwell and 1984 Pop Conference. Our speaker is Devrim Kılıçer. Uh, Dr. Devrim Kılıçer received her PhD from Ankara University, Department of American Culture and Literature in 2007. Her PhD dissertation, titled The Symbolic and Ontological Meanings of Skyscraping, New York City, was published in 2008 with the title Tower Power. Her areas of interest include cultural studies, literary criticism, and diaspora studies. Currently, she teaches at Ankara University, Department of American Culture and Literature, and is the head of that department for three years now. I think so. <laughs> and uh, her title today is Against the Wall and 1984. Thank you. So thank you Atulu University for inviting me here and thank you all for being here. We sit here as a woman, day room evolution and transition. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't know if I can read off to my name, but you'll see. Uh, I was told there would be non-literature people in the audience, so I want to begin with why literature matters. And as a literature person, while studying, trying to write you know, my article, I asked the question, what good is this? But it is, I think, important. And Susan Zontag, at, in, at the same time, explains it really clearly. She says, literature can train and exercise our ability to weep for those who are not us or ours. Who would we be if we could not sympathize with those who are not us or ours? Who would we be if we could not forget ourselves at least some of the time? Who would we, we be if we could not learn, forget, become something other than we are? And likewise, uh, in her commencement address at McGill University, Judith Butler proclaims, Humanities give us a chance to read across languages and cultural differences in order to understand the vast range of perspectives in and on this world. And she adds, talking about uh, the value of reading and humanities, how else can we imagine living together without this ability to see beyond where we are, to find ourselves linked with others we have never directly known? and to understand that, in some abiding and urgent sense, we share a world." End of quote. And I think this link between what lit literature and you know, life is a very, is a very pre pressing issue at this time, where we have the you know, anti-humanities Bologna process, which we cannot get out of. Mm, and Butler, okay, she said those, and the decade before Butler, again, Susan Zonta considered the role of reading and writing, the role of literature in liberating us from our immediate limitations by anchoring us to a larger reality. And again, in a prize acceptance speech entitled Literature and Freedom, Zontag, uh, we witnessed Zontag's inspiring wisdom on courage and resistance. She notes that much of her life has been uh, called, devoted to trying to demystify ways of thinking that polarize and oppose. And she adds, one task of literature is to formulate questions and construct counter statements to the reigning pieties. And even when art is not oppositional, the arts gravitate toward contra contrariness. Literature is dialogue responsiveness. Literature might be described as the history of human responsiveness to what is alive and what is moribund as cultures evolve and interact with one another." End of quote. Moreover, uh, she argues that the authors have a certain responsibility in the viewing of the very myths to which we su subscribe in seeking to understand the world's vitality and viewing them in such a way that we find ourselves laced together than ripped apart. She says, 
Writers can do something to combat these cliches of our separateness, our difference. For writers are makers, not just translators of myths. Literature offers not only myths, but counter myths, just as life offers counter experiences, experiences that confound what you thought you thought or felt or believed. Uh, she adds, I have quoted <laughs> a, lot, a lot from Sontag, but literature, from literature and freedom. Uh, she says, a writer, I think, is someone who pays attention to the world. That means trying to understand, take in, connect with what wickedness human beings are capable of. And not be corrupted, made cynical, superficial by this understanding. End of quote. The kind of wickedness in the form of totalitarianism erasing individuality and freedom that human beings are capable of is taught to us in 1984. Any expression of individuality is banned in Oceania, including diary writing and sexual intercourse for only pleasure, but not for reading three kids for the future. Keeping a diary and having unauthorized sexual intercourse become political acts and forms of rebellion in Oceania. Individualism is called own life in Newspeak and suggests eccentricity and nonconformity with the party. The narrator tells us, quote, In principle, a party member had no spare time and was never alone except in bed. It was assumed that when he was not working, eating or sleeping, he would be taking part in some kind of communal recreation. To do anything that suggested a taste for solitude, even to go for a walk by yourself, was always slightly dangerous. End of With own life not allowed in Oceania, lives of the masses are under constant watch. And the novel is in its, in its profound analysis of the horrors of a totalitarian regime is a testimony and a warning to the readers what terrors might arise if we let ourselves fall into the hands of the <coughs> strong man dictators. On, but uh, Orwell thinks otherwise, uh, because he, not Orwell thinks otherwise, he was accused of uh, undermining the ideals of socialism through 1984, and he responded in a press release. He was not directly you know, attacking British, attacking uh, British Labour Party. He says, and all those emphases are <laughs> fine, he didn't do those. Uh, he says, my recent novel is not intended as an attack on socialism or on the British Labour Party, of which I am a supporter but as a show of all the perversions to which a centralized economy is liable and which have already been partly realized in communism and fascism. I do not believe that the kind of society I describe necessarily will arrive, but I believe that something resembling it could arrive. I believe also that totalitarian ideas have taken root in the minds of intellectuals everywhere, and I have tried to draw these ideas out to their logical consequences. The scene of the book is laid in Britain in order to emphasize that the English-speaking races are not innately better than anyone else, and that totalitarianism, if not fought against, could thrive everywhere. Although you know, Orwell said this, uh, the novel, I, I think, uh, has an obvious re reference to Stalinist Russia, the big brother with his dark and <laughs> big mustache, really uncanny and resembles Stalin himself. And Orwell himself sta stated that Nazi Germany was not entirely removed from his mind. And at this point, I'd like to turn to Hannah Arendt and her 1951 book, The Origins of Totalitarianism. This work is a study of the Nazi and Stalinist regimes that created a wide-ranging debate on the nature and historical antecedents of, the, of totalitarianism. What was required, in Arendt's view, was a new framework 
that could enable us to come to terms with the twin horrors of the 20th century, Nazism and Stalinism. One had concentration camps, which, like, which uh, on their doors brought Arbeit macht frei, working makes you free, and the other had gulags. Um, totalitarianism has been identified by many writers as a ruthless, brutal, and thanks to modern technology, potent form of political tyranny whose ambitions for world domination are unlimited. Disseminating propaganda derived from an ideology through the media of mass communication, totalitarianism relies on mass support. It crushes whoever and whatever stands in its way by means of terror and proceeds to a total reconstruction of the society it displaces. Such achievements require total one-party governmental control and tremendous human sacrifice. The elimination of free choice and individuality, the politicization of the private wise, the private sphere, including that of the family, and the denial of any notion of the universality of human rights. It is the age when totalitarian forms of government, again such as Nazism and Stalinism, have emerged as a result of the institu institutionalization of terror and violence. Quote, it is the age where history as a natural process has replaced history as a fabric of actions and events, where homogeneity and conformity have replaced plurality and freedom, and where isolation and loneliness have eroded human solidarity and all spontaneous forms of living together. Modernity is the age where the past no longer carries any certainty of evaluation, where individuals, having lost their traditional standards and values, must search for new grounds of human community as such. End of quote. Um, Arendt in the end says, uh, Totalitarianism is never content to rule by external means, namely through the state and the machinery of violence. Thanks to its peculiar ideology and the role assigned to it in this apparatus of coercion, totalitarianism has divorced a means of has discovered a means of dominating and terrorizing human beings from within. <coughs> this fear from within and emanating from fear, self-discipline is inflicted on people as a general, general rule within totalitarian regimes, not only in panopticon prisons. Arendt, con Arendt concluded that Hitler and Stalin discovered that the eradication of the unpredictability of human affairs, of human freedom, and of human nature itself is possible in True in the true central institution of totalitarian organizational power, the concentration camp. And if you have seen the movie of the book, 1984, you could see old London London in all its places. It looks like a concentration camp. Uh, in concentration camps, the combination of the practice of terror with the principle of logicality, which is uh, which is the nature of totalitarianism, resolves the conflict in constitutional governments between legality and justice by ridding human beings of individual consciences and making them embodiments of the laws governing the motion of nature and history. On the one hand, in the worldview of totalitarianism, the freedom of human beings is inconsequential to the undeniable automatism of natural and historical processes or at most an impediment to their freedom. On the other, when the iron band of terror destroys human plurality, so totally dominating human beings that they cease to be individuals and become a mere mass of identical, interchangeable specimens of the animal species man, the terror provides the movement of nature and history with an incomparable instrument of acceleration. Terror and logicality welded together equip totalitarian regimes with the unprecedented power to dominate human beings. 
our totalitarian systems accomplish their inversion of political life above all. How, how they set about destroying human conscience and the plura plurality of unique human individuals staggers the imagination and confounds the faculty of understanding. For Arendt, therefore, the enormity and unprecedentedness of totalitarianism have not destroyed, strictly speaking, our ability to judge. Rather, they have destroyed our accepted st standards of judgment and our conventional categories of interpretation and assessment, be they moral or political. And in this situation, the only recourse is to appeal to the imagination. And imagination allows us to view things in their proper perspective and to judge, and to judge them without the benefit of a pre-given rule or universal. For Arendt, the imagination enables us to create the distance which is necessary for an impartial judgment, while at the same time allowing for the closeness that makes understanding possible. In this way, it makes possible our reconciliation with reality, even with the tragic reality of the 20th century. It is this imagination that we can take refuge in and can find hope for all humanity against all oppressive regimes. It is this imagination that creates literature, music, film, all forms of art. And what links 1984 through you know, other works of art lies in its imag imaginative portrayal of how totalitarian re regimes beat up, engineer, and transform people to machines living in societies of control. And one of these works of art is Pink Floyd's 1979 album, The Wall. The subsequent movie of 1982, The Wall, traces the life of the fictional protagonist, Pink Floyd, from his boyhood days in the post-World War II England to his self-imposed isolation as a world-renowned rock star, leading to a destructive climax. No imagination, no individual expression is allowed in Pink's world. Every incident that causes Pink pain is yet another brick in his ever-growing wall a fatherless childhood, a domineering mother, an out-of-touch out education system bent on producing compliant machines in the societal wheel, a government that treats its citizens like puppets. As his world nears completion, each brick further closing him off from the rest of the world, Pink falls into insanity and his fragmented psyche turns into the very dictatorial persona that antagonized the world that antagonized the world during World War II, scarred his nation, killed his father, and in essence, destroyed his own life from birth. Um, I'm just going to show you a three-minute three clip from the movie The Wall in the flesh.
think that would be enough for you to see the uncanny you know, similarities between 1984 and the wall. Right? You see Bob Geldof there as the big brother. <laughs> um, and Pink's life from the outset uh, revolves around an abyss of loss and isolation. He begins to build a mental wall, like the mind forged manacles of William Blake in London, between himself and the rest of the world, so that he can live in a constant alienated equilibrium, free, of, free from life's emotional troubles. Pink's world, since childhood, calls for obedience and uniformity in order to stay away from pain, the pain of being an individual. And the strict system of education is a tool to achieve this end. Imagine listening to another book in the world. And as Pink and Winston in the end fail, but what matters is that they have tried, they have they resisted. And as both works, the wall and 1984, as both testify, it is important to see that. Wherever there is oppression, there is also resistance. Sontag in the end says, all struggle, all resistance is and must be concrete. And all struggle has a global resonance. If not there, if not here, then there. If not now, then soon elsewhere as well as here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kubitash. This is for the, the humble dancer. Thank you very much. Now the floor is open to questions. Any questions? Everybody's tired. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kubitschak. And let me remind you that there will be a five-minute break, coffee break, and afterwards there will be a, a wrap-up session uh, chaired by Professor Bergen Alvin. And we invite all our uh, speakers and chairs uh, to the sessions, to the stage. Thank you.